All right, good evening everyone. Just want to know the sound is okay. Looks okay so far. Good evening also for those who are watching online. I'm glad to have you with me tonight. Just let me make a few announcements before we start. Uh, if you have your schedule for the book of Isaiah, everything is easy so far. We are in March the 24th. We have one last session, March the 31st, next Wednesday. And then we get into April for the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th, and May for five sessions, depending on where in May we will be. Because I don't want to embark into a new segment of the book here. Hello, Vicky, we're merely starting here. Um, you're welcome, sister. And leave you right in the middle of something. So we will see how we go, we goes and how it goes. And I would like to finish on one thing. And in September, we just carry on with our studies. Make a note now for those who partake in the Saturday, uh, Saturday morning class. This coming Saturday and tomorrow night, Thursday, we have the church meeting. And Saturday morning, we will be having our sessions on Revelation. And then the following Saturday, normal, that does not affect the Thursday, <coughs> we have the church meeting. There will be no class on Saturday, April the 3rd. So I'd like to warn you in advance slowly for how it goes and so on. No, 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 this will come as we move along and so on. I haven't decided yet. So thank you for persevering in our activities in study of the Isaiah. The best is yet to come. We're not out of the book of it. Each uh, chapter has uh, nuggets that we like. And also some passages can be also difficult to teach and difficult to receive. But I would like to encourage you. So I think it will be basically, as far as I'm concerned, a once in a lifetime it's not a study that is very often requested by the people. And to do, to do it to the extent that we do it here, it's a blessing. So, and I would like to bless you and to thank you for, um, for being here and doing it. Uh, this is very important. It shows good stewardship. Let me encourage you sometimes. You know, I come across a bit kind of a harsh at times a little bit. But now I praise you for your dedication to it and your dedication in studying the Word of God. And it will never be taken away from you. So let me have a candy. Seems to have a... You very well know, on a more personal note, that last week, and for the last three weeks, I had Guylaine, Sylvie's daughter, which is my niece. And of course, I did the work that I wanted to do with her having a time by ourselves and go out, which we did uh, last week before she left, and make it clear the passages of the gospel, the, 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 the good news. She didn't make a decision out of the spot. I basically did not offer it. I just offered the option uh, <coughs> in a time of, <coughs> for her, of hopelessness. I knew that spiritual warfare would come. It came last night. Last night, I was supposed, Monday night, I did not... Monday night, I did a session from Nanaimo, very difficult session on Zoom with Nanaimo. And then I was supposed to do Zoom last night on the book of Jude, which is easy. I was not capable. I was not functioning, felt dizziness, heaviness, and plain discouragement. I thought about taking a sabbatical, heavy, uh, heavy. I went to bed, I can't remember what time. Could not speak very much, so I canceled a class at 6 for a class only for one hour. And uh, this morning, the evening was, was away. So that's what happened when you expose yourself to so much in the faith. I would like to ask you to protect yourself also. In these classes, you receive a lot. And the enemy doesn't like these things at all. So he will be on your back also. So as far as I'm concerned, it did happen. And faithfully enough, it will happen again. That's the sign of discipleship. That's what, what, what happened to those who are dedicated to these things. So, having said this, I would like you to pray for the ministry that we do here. Pray for the support also. It's, you know the price of things all over the place and so on. Thank you in advance for those who are responding properly to these things. Praise the Lord for everybody. But I would like to encourage you to persevere in prayer for the ministry, myself and my wife and my family and all the people among you that participate in these things. Tonight, I'm delighted in a moment that we start in a word of prayer. 
Did you enjoy the slideshow last week? Did you enjoy seeing a few pictures of Egypt and so on? That's good. So tonight I will repeat. We are on capital G. I gave you four things. I repeat them. So we start Egypt and we have also a PowerPoint for tonight. Beloved, let's take a silent time, prayer, and we move on in our stuff. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and patience with people like us. Your priest, Father, that seeks to serve you and understand your word. We are thank you, thankful, Father, for the content of it. The Bible is a thick book. We don't need to take away from it, and we have enough of what's being revealed to us. We have a lifetime, Father, to spend and to study these books. And because we're finite, tired, and we travel time with excessive speed, uh, we don't get the fullness of it. We're too finite. You are infinite. However, we know one thing, that this is your will for us to study the 66 books of the Bible. That much is clear. That's what you have chosen to reveal, and we thank you for this. Help us out, Lord, to come as children, dependent on you, dependent on your Holy Spirit to be able to understand what we need to understand tonight. We give you thanks in advance, dear Lord. Help us out and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we... Carry on with Egypt. Lots will be said. We take, your we take our time. So you should be chapter 19 of the book of Isaiah. I'm just going to close the door because of the fan. Chapter 19, verses 1 to 25, Egypt. Some in uh, fun information tonight concerning this. The whole... Uh, Chapter 19 from verses 1 to 25, basically, we'll cover that tonight or almost, is subdivided on your outline on page 10 in seven points. Capital, not capital, but uh, uh, Arabic number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Point number 7 being subdivided by 3. So basically, I'm just alluding to your outlines right now. So we take, number one, the coming of the civil war, okay? Judgment will come upon Egypt by means of a civil war here, the coming of the civil war, verses 1 to 4. The oracle concerning Egypt, behold, Jehovah is riding on a swift cloud, circled swift cloud, and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt, circle the idols, because I will allude quite, quite often to that, will tremble at his presence. And the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. I will incite Egyptians against Egyptians, and they will each fight against his brother, and each against his neighbor. City against city, and kingdom against kingdom. Verse 3. Then the spirit, small less, of the Egyptians will be demoralized within them, and I will confound their strategy so that they will resort to idols, circle idols, and ghosts again of the dead, and to mediums, circle mediums and spiritists. Moreover, I will deliver the Egyptians into the hand of a cruel master, and a mighty king will rule over them, declares Jehovah of Oz. The coming judgment by means of the, spirit, uh, the civil war spells out four things which you already have in your notes. Number one, there will be a judgment of the Shekinah glory. So that's why whenever the cloud is used symbolically, riding on the clouds, it's a symbolism of the Shekinah glory. So there will be a judgment of the glory against the idolatry. Like I did explain to you last week when we watched the slideshow, idolatry and ghosts and mediums and so on were very strong in Egypt. I showed you the bottles in which they basically embalmed the body, believe in the resurrection and reunited, and they preserved the organs of the people. That's pure witchcraft. God does not want these things to happen for sure. 
there will be a judgment on this. If you want references concerning the Shekinah glory with the same terminology, you go to Psalm 18.10, Psalm 18.10, and Nahum, the minor prophet, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 18.10, Nahum, the minor prophet, verses 1 to 3. It's the second thing, there will be the judgment of the civil war. Okay, there will be wild confusion. So the totality of the land of Egypt will be confused. It's in verse 2. That's why the same expression are used concerning the great tribulation and concerning the end time when Jesus said, Egyptians against Egyptians and cities against cities and kingdom against kingdom. In the area of context, it means total conflict. Here, it's not total conflict around the world, but it's total conflict in the area of Egypt. That's the context. So you can see that when Christ says uh, cities against cities and kingdoms against kingdoms, that was fulfilled by the first war, world war, first and second. That's the same. That's a Jewish idiom, meaning total conflict in the area of the context. So when these judgment will come upon the people of Egypt, it will be total conflict among the Egyptian. Number three in verse three. Here it's against occult practices. The occult practices, the tombs and the doors that I've shown you in dark caves and so on. Things that are seen to this day in the land of Egypt, in ancient temples and so on. And number four, the judgment of a cruel oppressor against Egypt in verse four. We don't know who it is, it's not named, but there will be cruel oppressors at that time. Maybe an oppressor basically sent by God. Now we begin our exposition of Arabic number two on your outlines. The destruction of natural resources. Come with me in 5 to 10. We read and now we make notes. So I'm going to slow down a bit. The waters from the sea will dry up and the river will be parched and dry. The canals will emit a stench. The streams of Egypt will thin out and dry up. Circle the reeds and rushes will rot away. The bulrushes by the Nile, by the edge of the Nile, and all the sown field by the Nile will become dry, be driven away, and be no more. Verse 8, And the fishermen will lament, and all those who cast a line into the Nile will mourn, and those who spread nets on the water will pin away. Moreover, the manufacturers of linen, circle linen, made from comb flax, you can circle comb flax as well, and the weavers of the white cloth will be utterly dejected. And the pillars of Egypt will be crushed, and the hired laborers, circle high and laborers, will be grieved in soul. Here under Arabic number two, we have the destruction of Egypt national resources. The Nile River, for the Egyptian people to this day, it's on the map right here, the Nile River, it's an issue for them of life and death. They are very dependent on the Nile. Remember the plagues of Egypt in the book of Exodus, the Nile was affected. Everything basically in Egypt being 90% sand. So the Nile plays a great work in the economy of the people of Egypt. In verses 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, God will judge the Nile and it will be affecting four industries of Egypt. Four industries of Egypt. If you look at the picture, I'll show you more in a moment of time. In verse 6, the canals will emit a stench. It's already stinky anyway. 
the streams of Egypt will thin out and dry up, dry up. The reeds and the rushes will rot away, and so on. That's what you find along the Nile. This picture was taken by myself as well as, well as this one. These are the reeds and the, bush, the bushes and the rushes will rot away. And it counts also for 7a, the bulrushes and so on. The papyrus industry will suffer because out of these things here, they make the papyrus. Basically, they dry out the stem of it. They flatten them out. Therefore, it dries off. You can see that this is the stem, not the leaves, but the stem of it. And then that's how they do papyrus. That's the write on it. Look at the board right now. So it opens like a book. That's why you can see the holes fitting. It's Greek literature right there. And that's how they do the papyrus. So the papyrus industry, which are they keen for, they invited me 10 times to look at the papyrus industry, which is refined. That's where they do, they do the paper and so on, will suffer. Okay? So as soon as you affect the Nile, the first thing that will be affected is the papyrus industry. How long do they last when they write? Have they found stuff that's thousands of years old? No, not that goes back to the origin of Egypt, not thousands of years old, because they are too fragile, but centuries for sure. Yes. Number seven, verse seven, you have the crop industry, the bulrushes by the Nile, by the edge of the Nile in verse seven, and all the sown fields by the Nile will become dry, be, rid of, be driven away, and be no more. The Nile here that you see, because I've been there, today it's filled with garbage, unfortunately, but you have the Nile River and it's full of veins, small rivers that goes in the land. That's how they irrigate the land and so on. And when they don't have the Nile, basically they suffer. Verse 8, the fish industry. That's the third aspect, the four industries. And lastly, verse 9 here. Moreover, the manufacturers of linen made of comb flax and the weaver of white cloth will be utterly rejected. That's what they, they stripped of cloths in order to mummify the dead and so on. And that industry will suffer as well. That's why they use, when you go to the Cairo Museum, those who are mummified come from all that kind of stuff also, the products of the Nile. The result of, the result of that say, um, civil war that is coming are found in verse 10. And the pillars of Egypt will be crushed and the higher laborers will be grieved in soul. So the judgment will simply lead to unemployment. There is nothing to do in Egypt. If you affect the Nile that much, there is not much to do in Egypt. We will learn when that civil war will come and so on. And he will also, I say, allude to things of the future things also. Now we come to number three, the foolishness of the leaders of Egypt, 11 to 15. Visualize your passage. We're doing very good. The, print, uh, the 11 to 15. Now we come to the foolishness of the leaders of Egypt. The princes of Zoan, circle Zoan, are mere fools. The advice of Pharaoh's uh, wisest advisor has become stupid. How can you men say to Pharaoh, I am a son of the wise, a son of the ancient kings? Well then, where are your wise men? Please let them tell you and let them understand what Jehovah was as purposed against Egypt. The princes of Zoan have acted foolishly. The princes of Memphis are deluded. Circle Zoan again in Memphis. Those who are the, those who are the corner stone of our tribes have led Egypt astray. 
verse 13, circle lead Egypt astray. Jehovah, Jehovah has mi mixed within her spirit of distortion. They have led Egypt astray in all that it does. As a drunken man staggers in his vomit, there will be no work for Egypt with its head or tail, its palm branch or bulrush may do. That's what I wanted to have right now. The city of Zoan, I wrote it down here by hand. It's located roughly right there where it says Zoan. This is my writing because you don't see that on the maps. So Zoan is on the nor northwest border, also called Tanis, T-A-N-T-A-N-I-S. It's also called Tanis. I'll come back to it in a moment. In verse 11, to go back there for a moment, I forgot to tell it, you have the status of the princes and the advisors of Egypt. They're fools. I think some of our governments today are just imitating, imitating Egypt a little bit. So the status of princes and the advisors are full. I say it taunts them. Scares them or taunts them in verse 11b. The advice of Pharaoh's wisdom, adv wisest advisors, have become stupid. Have become stupid. How can you men say to Pharaoh, I am a son of the wise, a son of ancient kings, and so on. Okay, so once again, going back to Zoan, it's basically located on the north top border, also called Tanis today. And in verse 12, I say is bold enough to taunt Pharaoh himself. Okay, he says in verse 12, well then, where are your wise men? Please let them tell you and let them understand what the Lord of hosts has purposed against Egypt. Let me paraphrase that. I will repeat it twice. Basically, I say, I'm saying here, can you come up with a plan against me? Can you come up with a plan against me, Pharaoh? That's what he says. And it's impossible. Can you come up with a plan against me, Pharaoh? It's not going to work because Jehovah has purposed these things. Once again, if you can take something to the door tonight, be awestruck by this. We have a God that is very much in control and nothing can happen to you outside of God's will and God's plan. When he decrees something, it will happen. It's good for the messianic kingdom. It's good for the end of time. It's good for the great tribulation. And once again, I'm asking you in your maturity not to ask for these things not to happen because they will happen. Our work is to intercede for the saints, spreading the gospel to the people that when these things will hit the people that they may be saved and not go through these things. Okay? These judgments are decreed and it will happen. Okay? Verses 13 and 14, he drives the point home. The princes of Zoan have acted foolishly. The princes of Memphis are deluded. Those who are, at the, uh, those who are the cornerstone of her tribes, meaning that the, the leaders of Egypt, have led Egypt astray. And they circle that. The point is now driven home. They have led Egypt astray. And it's still happening today, and we saw it. If you Google the wars in Egypt against Israel, every single time they have led the people astray in undertaking war against Egypt, even in recent time. So every single time that they have made the Egyptian a campaign against Israel, 
they have suffered a tremendous loss all the time. Why? Their leaders have led them astray, believing that they can conquer Israel. It's impossible to do. So what we see there can reflect in modern history. It has not changed. They don't learn the lesson. Okay? So the four campaign of Egypt against Israel had in the past devastating consequences. Devastating consequences. Why you know these things? Not because the Jews are better people. Be careful with this. I'm going to make a presentation in a church in Crofton in a month, basically, where the pastor there asked me to speak about Israel type of thing. Okay? Not because they're better. You know that. You have done enough class with me. That's the wife of Jehovah. That's the elect nation. And even if they are standing in unbelief for the majority of them, apart from the remnant here, you don't play with the apple of his eye. Okay? So when I say that I love the Jews, I don't love the Jews because they're better than anybody. It's because, it's because that's God's people. All the covenants, uh, the, 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 the covenants, the five covenants of the scriptures, not out of eight, but five of them are made with Israel in which we have become partakers. So we need to learn lessons from these things. And that's why often I ask you, those online and those present, that before you make a tick mark to vote, in our countries and yours in the past, to at least ask the leader or the representative, the MP of your place, what's the policy of your government concerning Israel? We don't pay close attention to that enough. We're always concerned about the, our pension plan, the medical system. Fine, legit. Uh, right now, we don't even talk about uh, abortion anymore. Um, uh, gay rights and stuff, these are behind us because they're all given to that kind of stuff. But the primary thing to do, it's what's the policy of our governments, plural, against the thing of Israel, because that can change the course and the blessing of a country. In verse 13, back there for a moment in Zoan, Zoan is the north and Memphis is the south, down south. So all these things will affect upper and lower Egypt, the south and the north. Upper Egypt in that case is the south, but it doesn't matter. So that's why he goes with Memphis. Look at Memphis here. It's down south in upper Egypt. And lower Egypt is Zoan and Memphis. He named the, these two to mean from A to Z, in a sense, and everything in between. That's why he does it like this. Okay? Yes? My King James uses the word, the word printed of note, N-O-P-H. N-O-P-H? Nof? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, for Memphis? Yeah, the footnote yeah. is that in Memphis. Yeah. Yeah, the footnotes, that's the same. The, your Nof in Memphis is the same thing. Yeah, in the footnotes, mine says uh, Memphis, actually, without a footnote and so on. All right, just to explain that this is from A to Z. Against the result, once again, sorry, again, the result, there will be no work for Egypt, which is head or tail, its palm branches and bulrush may do. Without losing your place in Isaiah, Without losing your place in Isaiah, those online also, would you come with me in the book of Ezekiel, which is after Isaiah? Go to Ezekiel 29 for a moment, please. Ezekiel chapter 29 for a moment. It's after Isaiah, not before. Chapter 29 of Ezekiel, verses 8 to 12. I'm going to read it for you. Don't lose your place in Isaiah. Okay. I'm reading Ezekiel right now. Chapter 29, verses 8 to 12. Come. Therefore, says Jehovah God, I'll wait. I wait for you, Ernie. Find your place, brother. 
Yeah, no, find your place. I apologize. Vicky, is the pace okay? Everybody seemed to be there. Beautiful. Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 8 and 12, and I'm glad to send you there. I'm not planning to do Ezekiel after Isaiah. I'm going to have to do something else. But it correlates. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah go together. Sometimes they speak about the same thing. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 29, verses 8 and 12. Therefore, says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon you a sword, and I will cut off from you men and beasts. The land of Egypt will become a desolation and waste. They will know that I am Jehovah. Circle, they will know that I am Jehovah. Then they will know that I am Jehovah. Because you said, the Nile is mine and I have made it. Therefore, behold, I am against you and against your, ri your rivers and I will make the land of Egypt another waste and desolation from Migdal to, to Siene and even to the border of Ethiopia. A man's foot will not pass through it, and the foot of a beast will not pass through it, and it will not be inhabited for 40 years. Circle for 40 years. So I will make the land of Egypt a desolation in the midst of a desolated lands, and her cities in the midst of cities that are laid waste, Will be, for, will be desolate for 40 years, and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the land. Okay, let's go back to Isaiah. What Isaiah spelled out so far, not Ezekiel, but Isaiah, there will be a series of judgment in Egypt that will cause a tremendous devastation. In the land of Egypt, that's Isaiah that says this, a judgment is coming, causing devastations in the land and unemployment. Causing devastations in the land as well as unemployment. Ezekiel adds things here that we don't have in Isaiah. The devastation of Egypt will be like the Jews to an extent that will, it will cause a dispersion of the Egyptian people. They will be dispersed. And when this will come to pass, the dispersion of the Egyptian, the land will lay completely desolate in Egypt. With no one passing through it for 40 years. With no one passing through it for 40 years. This has not been fulfilled yet. It's to come I will elaborate later. When this final devastation of Egypt will come, not in the time of Isaiah, but in the future, that's what will happen to Egypt. Now we're back to Isaiah. And now Isaiah, at this point being back, to him in verse 4, look at not verse 4, at point 4 on your outline. Now Isaiah will start dealing with the progression. He will start dealing with the progression with the progression that will lead to Egypt's national regeneration of the Egyptian people. Louis, you must be interested by that because you asked a question months ago about the Arab state. It's one of the nuggets of it that we go through right now. Because there will be a time in the future where national Egypt will be saved. It's probably completely new unto you. 
but you know that I am a literalist. There is no way possible to allegorize these things. Point number four, before the pause, Egypt's fear of Israel, 16 and 17. Finish your notes, Vicky. Do I need to repeat anything for those who yeah. would like to accomplish the note? What would you like to know, Germain? What would you like I me to repeat? To start dealing with, uh, with the progression of Egypt. that will lead, that will lead... We are in the context of Egypt all the time. We never left that context. That will lead to Egypt's national regeneration. Okay. okay? And needless to tell you that if you go in Egypt today, I was there in what year? 2015 or 14? The, the picture says it. They're not safe there. Okay? It's, 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 it's an unbelieved nation apart from those who believe, of course. That's what we are working right now. So now you come with me very carefully. Concentration in verses 16 to 17, Terry. Are you there? Beautiful. In that day, that's very significant. I want you to highlight in that day. The Egyptians will become like women and they will tremble and be in dread because of the waving of the hand of Jehovah of hosts, which he is going to wave over them. The land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of Jehovah of hosts, which he is purposing against them. The them is the Egyptian. Notice once again the expression in that day. It's prophetic future. In that day, now Isaiah goes into a distant time. It's prophetic. In that day, the emphasis about women, it's fear and trembling. A woman, let alone here at the 2 a.m. in the morning on Lewis Street, you walk and you can be in fear and trembling, maybe, okay? Or downtown New York, name it. That's why a lady is named there, a lady that needs protection, fear more than men, and so on. Verse 17, the cause of it, the Jews. The mere mention in the future, the mere mention of Jews, Israel, Judah will cause them to tremble. Don't even mention the name. It will frighten the Egyptians. The mere mention of it in verse 17. The land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of Jehovah of hosts, which he purposed against them. Okay, this is something that we might have seen to an extent because they are now in dread of, of, of Israel as we speak because of the four campaigns that I just said to you. So to an extent, we, we see already this attitude. When on the news, they can hear in Egypt that Israel is not happy against them. Oh, no, not another defeat coming. That's the mentality is already instilled at that place. Okay? Number five. Egypt and the Hebrew language. Only one verse. Verse 18. We do it and we pause. Egypt and the Hebrew language. Verse 18. It's, it's a paragraph by itself because my 18 and my 19 in my Bible are bold. So in the Hebrew original text, it's a chunk by itself. In that day, you circle that again. Five cities in the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to Jehovah Hovos. One will be called the city of destruction. Circle the city of destruction. In that day, once again, the prophetic future. Five cities in Egypt will be speaking Hebrew, the language of Israel. 
those of you in your Bible that have the city of destruction, it's not really proper, nor in my Bible. The city of destruction is right here, Heliopolis. That's the city of the sun, S-U-N. It's a reference to the city of Heliopolis. Don't ask me to spell it because you can see that on the screen, on the TV screen. It's verse uh, 18. Okay, I just want to check my slide for in case because I put these slides together this afternoon. We did the Piperus. Okay, we'll come back to this one. We'll leave it there. The city of destruction, it's in reference to the city of Heliopolis, the city of the sun. I need to spell it because it's not up there. It's not up there. It's no longer up there. Elio, H E L I Polis, P O L I S. Metropolitan. You know, polis, it's a city. Elio, it's the sun. Okay? Not S-O-N, but S-U-N. All right? Up to Sadan. Okay? The president of Egypt. Visit to Israel. Up to that visit to Israel. Can't remember the year. Maybe you can search that for me. The Hebrew language was forbidden in Egypt. Up to his visit to Israel. Now, it's no longer forbidden to speak Hebrew. And some Bible expositors said, this verse has been fulfilled. No, it can change at any moment of time. Saddam made a visit to Israel. And when he visited Israel in peace, the language was spoken back in the land of Egypt. But there will come a time when this will change and we don't know when. Okay, be careful with newspaper exegesis because things might change very rapidly. We cannot say because some speak Hebrew in Israel right now without being persecuted. Things might change quite rapidly as the world is slowly turning and turning more anti-Semitic and more anti-Semitic. Okay, as the end of time is approaching. Okay, so far two stages. First, the fear of Israel, and second, the Hebrew language. And now the third stage is after the pause right now, which will be the natural regeneration of Egypt. It's not the natural, it's a mistake, change it right now. It's not natural, it's national. Made a mistake here, I need to correct it myself. We pause. Yes.